Good afternoon, Senior Deputies, State Legislative Liaisons, Public Health Lawyers, and Regional Health Equity Councils. Welcome to the webinar on Exploring Social Impact Bonds, Pay for Success Models, Innovative Financing Model for Public Health Agencies. I am R.V. Smith, and I am the Chair of the Senior Deputies Committee, and I'm also the Deputy State Health Officer in North Dakota and the State Legislative Liaison for the North Dakota Department of Health. This is the first time that the senior deputies have jointly hosted a webinar with other ASTO peer networks and public health partners. The goal of the webinar is to collaboratively explore how to implement social impact bonds. Social impact bonds are a powerful tool to provide and improve services for disadvantaged populations and can be used as a strategy to reduce health disparities. I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers who will highlight the various perspectives of ASTO's peer networks. Kaysen Schmidt serves as an Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education Legal Fellow with the Public Health Law Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He works with public health professionals within CDC centers and offices and state, tribal, local, and territorial partners to promote the use of law as a tool to improve the public's health. He is actively researching the national social impact bond landscape and is currently working on legal research relating to public health applications for SIBs. Next, we have Andrea Garcia, who is a public health lawyer and the Director of State Health Policy at ASTO. In her role at ASTO, she identifies and analyzes state legislative and regulatory trends impacting public health and state health agencies. She conducts legal research, supports the peer network of state health agency legislative liaisons, as well as a work group of state public health attorneys. Finally, John Supra is the Deputy Director for Information Management and Chief Information Officer at South Carolina's Department of Health and Human Services. Mr. Supra is responsible for the department's eligibility policy and operations, claims operations and provider relations, project management, human resources, and information technology. Mr. Supra has been instrumental in the state's pursuit of innovative financing through the Harvard-affiliated Social Impact Bond. At the conclusion of John Supra's presentation, we will have an open discussion and questions and answers. Please note that today's call is being recorded and all participant lines will be muted until the question and answer portion at the end of the program. So if everybody's ready, let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Uh, first, Kaysen Schmidt. Thank you, Ari, for that introduction. Um, I am Kaysen Schmidt. I'm an ORISE legal fellow and attorney with the Public Health Law Program. And because I'm an attorney, I have a disclaimer here for you. The contents of this presentation do not represent official CDC determinations or policies. The findings and conclusions of this report are those of the author and do not necessarily represent official position of the CDC. The contents are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for professional legal advice. Please always seek the advice of an attorney or other qualified professional with any questions you may have regarding a legal matter. Now, with that, I'll provide a brief introduction of social impact bonds. The significance of the social impact bond model. Beyond the moral and ethical costs, it's important to realize that social and public health problems cost money. And for example, homelessness has been estimated to cost society between six and seven billion dollars in shelter costs, welfare costs, Medicaid, and other costs. And while many of these costs can be prevented, many governments lack the funding needed to address the problems. The draw of the social impact bond model lies in its ability to transform those costs into potential profit. And if avoiding those costs becomes profitable, social impact bonds can leverage large amounts of private capital into social and public health programs. And this focus on prevention also makes social impact bonds a potentially useful tool to ease health inequities because many groups and communities suffer from poor health outcomes due to reduced access to preventative services. Using social impact bonds to increase access to prevention uh, to these populations may thus help lessen these inequities. 
perhaps from a policy perspective, one of the most attractive characteristics of social impact bond model is its potential to create a public policy trifecta, whereby the government, the private sector, and vulnerable populations all benefit, creating a rare win-win-win scenario. So what exactly are social impact bonds? Uh, well, they're financing mechanisms, and they're used to raise upfront funding for social and public health preventative interventions from private investors. And they function by leveraging the anticipated savings of prevention as a source for any financial rewards due to the intervention's investors. Rewards are due if and only if the intervention succeeds in reaching the predetermined benchmarks and thereby shifting the financial burden of success to investors. So why is this model attractive? Well, for governments, uh, it allows uh, the exploration of new solutions with limited financial risk that those problems will fail to deliver the expected outcomes. And they fund prevention, uh, focusing on getting positive outcomes. And because of this preventative focus, they provide an avenue to address health inequities. For intervention providers, they provide a means to obtain stable multi-year funding that amplifies their impact while building relationships with government. For philanthropic investors, social impact bonds give them the ability to, be, to evaluate the performance of their investments, an opportunity to scale their initiatives and to increase collaboration with stakeholders. Uh, for, com com sorry, for commercial investors, social impact bonds offer a promising new market for profit and opportunities for growth in social services. And finally, social impact bonds are attractive to intervention recipients who might not otherwise have access to needed programs. Now I want to go through a, an example of a social impact bond arrangement, but first it's important to note uh, that these tools are flexible by nature and they're new. So not all social impact bonds will look exactly like the following arrangement. The first step in the process is the communication between the intermediary, usually a nonprofit organization, and the social impact bond backer, the one responsible to pay for the social impact bond in the event that it succeeds. In many early social impact bond programs, a government is a backer, but this is not necessarily required. Once the intermediary uh, and the social impact bo bond backer determine the terms of the social impact bond, the intermediary uses those terms to at attract investors to provide the initial upfront funding for the intervention. The intermediary uses the social impact bonds or issues the social impact bonds to investors to secure that investment. In some circumstances, investors might be interested but afraid of the risks involved. And to make this investment more attractive, the intermediary can seek credit enhancement to lessen the risk to investors. In early social impact bonds, philanthropic organizations have typically provided credit enhancement to social impact bond investors. Often the credit enhancement is similar to insurance that guarantees some of the repayment in the event that the intervention fails to meet the terms. Uh, use of credit enhancement is assumed to lessen uh, if the social impact bonds uh, develop a proven track record. Once the intermediary gets the funding from the investors, the intermediary will often contract with an intervention provider who will then in turn provide the intervention to the target population. At predetermined times, an independent evaluator will determine whether or not uh, the predetermined benchmarks of the intervention were met. This evaluation determines the financial obligations of the party. So in a failure scenario, it means that the independent evaluator looked at the data and determined that the intervention failed to meet those predetermined benchmarks for success. And because the intervention failed to meet those benchmarks for success, 
the social impact bond backer is not obligated to pay the intermediary anything. If the intermediary obtained credit enhancement, then the credit enhancement would partially repay the investors, preventing a total loss. And the investors would suffer any, ad any additional loss. In a success scenario, well, that means that when the independent evaluator looked at the data, it determined that the intervention succeeded uh, in meeting the predetermined benchmarks. The social impact bond backer would then be obligated to pay their intermediary the cost of the initial investment plus any agreed upon profit. And this payment would then pass to the investors who hold the social impact bonds. Thus, the investors are happy because they got their investment back in full with a profit. The social impact bond backer is happy because the program worked and it was saved from spending even more money than if there was no intervention at all. And finally, probably most importantly, the target pop population is happy because they benefited from a successful program. So what kind of impacts are we talking about? There are a number of programs, uh, problems that are commonly cited as promising applications for social impact bonds. Recidivism, homelessness, workforce development, asthma reduction, diabetes, early childhood education are among the most commonly cited. And as evaluation data and other interventions become more available, um, more social impact bond applications are likely. I also wanted to highlight some select considerations for social impact bond programs. There are two main legal issues associated uh, with these. Uh, the first deals with appropriations. Governments do not typically enter into long contracts that make appropriations contingent. And there may be some difficulty in binding future legislatures or administrations to the terms of a social impact bond. The second is the issue of government silos, uh, specifically uh, government divisions between federal, state, local governments, and agencies within each layer can complicate reimbursement. The challenge is capturing all the potential savings where a social impact bond results in savings across several divisions. If the savings can be aggregated, then social impact bond programs could be much more lucrative. Standardization of the social impact bond model can provide assurance to investors that the new programs rely on models that have been successful. However, it has a drawback of potentially limiting innovation in, of social impact bond models. Uh, other critiques include the possibility that a social impact bond program could shift away uh, shift attention away from problems that are more or that are important uh, rather than problems that just save money. There's also concern uh, of investors influencing the delivery of the intervention. This concern highlights the importance of carefully defining social impact bond success so that investor incentives are properly aligned. It is also important to note that social impact bonds are inefficient structures due to their complexity. This makes them expensive alternatives to direct funding. Despite these concerns, social impact bonds remained a highly attractive financial mechanism to increase funding uh, and available to combat social and public health problems. Um, thank you. And uh, Oh, just to let you know, we, we do have some resources uh, here for additional reading. Uh, and we are developing a, a guide here uh, for, with the Public Health Law Program uh, for a research anthology. Um, but uh, with that, I believe I'll, I'll hand the baton off to Andrea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathan. Today I'm going to give you an overview of some of the legislative activity we've been seeing around social impact bonds. Um, APCO included social impact bonds in our 2014 state legislative perspective as an emerging issue um, for state public health to watch this session. We are currently tracking 29 bills in 12 states related to social impact bonds or pay for success models. Um, the key search terms used to find these bills are pay for success, social impact bonds, and then we broadened it a bit to include 
public-private partnerships. I would just note that um, this map includes um, bills um, from 2013 as well as 2014, um, 2013 bills being um, for those states who have carryover. So some of the trends that we're seeing include um, studying the feasibility of social impact bonds, establishing pilot projects, um, or creating a task force or steering committee to really guide um, the state around social impact bonds and, and pay for success financing. Fewer states are looking at authorizing state agencies to enter into these agreements, identifying specific contact, contact, contract requirements, um, establishing a trust fund, or appropriating funding. Um, for social impact bond projects. Um, before I go into these specific state examples, I would just note that many of the examples from the session seem to fall into the categories of early childhood development or criminal justice around reducing recidivism rates. Um, I would say there are fewer examples around prevention um, and, and health in general. Um, today I chose to highlight those that really do touch on prevention and healthcare services. Um, so this example is from Washington State. Uh, they had a bill this session that was looking to create a pilot project using either social impact bonds or another financing mechanism. And the Social Investment Steering Committee was really um, proposed to identify the financing model, look at the target population, and specific services that would be provided, come up with some specific measurable outcomes and a process to measure those outcomes, and then to identify legislative actions that would be needed for implementation. Before going on, I would just note when Kaysen talked about health equity, I think in identifying the target population and the services, many states um, outline that as a key step, and that is really where I see um, the potential to address um, health equity. This session, New Jersey looked at uh, creating a five-year social innovation pilot program, and this was focused on preventive and early intervention health care. Their legislation proposed that the Economic Development Authority in the state would guarantee loans to eligible organizations, and again, they required a method of measurement and verification to ensure that services were being performed and to calculate the public sector savings. They also proposed a social innovation loan fund to guarantee pilot program loans. The District of Columbia, uh, specifically uh, in their legislation, looked at criteria for awarding a social impact bond project um, contract. Um, the specific services they included were education, health, human care, or social services. And they also identify specific populations that the services would be provided to, so the disabled, disadvantaged, displaced, elderly, indigent, mentally ill, and the list um, goes on. The services have to be intended to mitigate and reduce social and health-related problems in the district. And the procurement for services have to be for a service that the agency typically purchases as needs arise, but it can't be accurately estimated at the outset. And then again, the agreement has to be in the best interest of the district. Connecticut's legislation touched on specific contract requirements. So the payment has to be based on reaching quantifiable outcomes and an independent evaluator's objective determination regarding performance benchmarks. Um, the amount and the timing of the payment um, would be um, determined if performance benchmarks are reached. Um, and there was a question actually in the legislation, what if, what if the um, benchmarks are only partially reached, then um, what, would, what would the payment be? Um, so I think there were also some questions raised um, by this proposal. Um, provisions authorizing the request of an appropriate, uh, appropriation each fiscal year of a contract um, equal to the expected amount the state is obligated to pay if the targets are reached, and then a fiscal analysis of projected savings. South Carolina had legislation around establishing a trust fund. This is pretty straightforward. The state treasurer would be the trustee administrator of the trust fund, and it has to be maintained separately from the general fund of the state and all other funds. I would just say that many of the bills uh, this session have been unsuccessful, and I think New York is really the exception. Um, I want to highlight this bill from 2013, which was enacted. 
um, in New York, it provided that state agencies, specifically including the Department of Health, could enter into contracts for services and expenses as pay for success initiatives um, to improve program outcomes in specific areas, including health care, early child development, child welfare, and public safety. Uh, this session, New York appropriated $53 million um, for their pay for success programs in these areas. And in March of 2014, um, they announced the four finalists uh, for their pay for success programs. And those include a nurse home visiting program for first time expectant low income mothers um, to improve pregnancy outcomes, child development, or child health and development. Um, the National Diabetes Prevention Program to reduce diabetes for at-risk populations, an enhanced uh, school-based health center to reach high-risk students with asthma and pregnancy prevention services, and then a, a program to provide diversion alternatives to probation officers and family court judges for the placement and detention of at-high-risk of high-risk youth. Um, so I will stop there, and I would just note that OSCO continues to follow. Um, progress in the states on these issues as well as to track legislation. Um, and our legislative tracking is available on our public policy website if you would like to see these bills and others that were mentioned today. And I believe I will turn it over to John to give the specific examples from South Carolina. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. And um, a real pleasure to be with you all this afternoon to talk a little bit about the project we have going on in South Carolina. I think I'll build very much on the things that Kaysen and some of the things Andrea pointed out. And I want to start with how we got involved um, in looking at a pay for success um, model to support some of our existing efforts in improving the birth outcomes in the state. Um, I'll generally use the, the pay for success term. As I think Andrea pointed out, the social impact bond term um, used really um, a lot in the United Kingdom where some of this started. Um, we've been using in South Carolina and some of the states the, the language of pay for success, and they're, they're really interchangeable there. Um, our state's been involved for um, over two years in a birth outcomes initiative in order to um, improve the birth outcomes, um, including um, reducing and working towards eliminating um, unnecessary and non-medically necessary um, inductions prior to 39 weeks, um, looking at reducing the NICU stays, and really by building a um, stakeholder group and community um, across the state, including um, our department as a convener, but many of the clinicians, the experts, the advocates throughout the state, um, we've been able to do a lot of good work in the birth outcomes. We um, saw pay for success is an opportunity to build on that work because there had already been some um, projects going on to support this that have had um, grants and philanthropic um, funded efforts, but those efforts were usually um, limited either in scope, their ability to scale, and as I talk through this, I think that's one of the important components um, both in our state and I think as states consider um, pay for success models. Um, we were um, approached at the Department of Health and Human Services by both some stakeholders, some advocates in the community as, as they saw Pay for Success as a potential opportunity to fund initiatives. And likewise, our governor's office has been very supportive in the opportunity to um, apply for um, the Harvard Kennedy School, the SIB lab there, um, their technical assistance. And about a year and a half ago, um, the governor's office and the department, along with some support from our legislative um, team, um, went ahead and applied for that grant. And that grant um, gave us the opportunity to have a um, Sib Lab fellow um, on site for a year of about a period, uh, about a year period. And um, along with other states and um, two um, cities. Um, that's made a really big difference in really driving and supporting and accelerating our effort to, to um, further define a pay for success project. So as we work to move forward, um, like one of the models that Andrea talked about um, in the New York um, 
example, we, we chose to target at-risk pregnant women, Medicaid um, women, um, to improve their birth outcomes, look at improving the maternal health as well as the newborn health, and see how that could also impact um, school readiness and early childhood health. And, and in doing that, looking to um, set metrics around how would you go about choosing interventions and programs that support that, as well as um, evaluating that. So um, one of the key components um, is how do we target those people most at risk and identify um, potential interventions that are appropriate for them. Um, we have been working on a home visitation program as part of our existing Medicaid managed care benefit, but we really hadn't been able to scale that or see the um, implementation that we thought we could expect. And we then really wanted to look at um, how do you evaluate that. And along with our initial um, development of this program, we um, had seen that there was broad investor potential. But at the same time, one of our early ideas was could we create a, a basket of interventions, a couple different intervention models, um, perhaps at different costs, at different levels of risk. And what we heard very early, and I'm going to talk about this several times, both from the investors and from others, is um, one of the challenges, because as Kaysen said, there's a lot of flexibility. Social impact bonds or pay for success models are new and flexible, but there's complexity in contracting, and it's important to think about what is a simple model, how do we make sure that we know the intervention and its evaluation that would be done by an outside evaluator is fair both to the state or the government who's funding it, as well as the um, investors. So as we've worked through this, one of the keys has been how do we simplify our model. Um, as we've been developing this um, for, I guess, a little over a year now, um, one of the, the real challenges is how do we take some of the goals um, for health outcomes, um, as I called it, the basket of potential interventions, and taking some of that advice um, from the investors to really um, focus on a more simplistic model, um, a clear project, and what we are moving forward with is, is looking at a model that takes one intervention. Um, we're, we're looking to um, work with probably about um, um, 4,000 um, pregnant mothers over a period of four years initially, and then track those results over a seven-year project. And that's one of the other um, elements about how can we look at projects that take time to develop as well? The other piece and challenge um, that we had was establishing baseline data and measurements out of our historical data so that we could look at what are we comparing against and what then are the baselines that the evaluation is going to measure against to actually show that the interventions are creating the results that we um, anticipate. And then I think as, as um, Kaysen, um sort of touched on at the end of his um, presentation is, is the Medicaid program, I expect most of you are aware that it's the federal partnership with the, the federal matching. So how does um, a pay for success model fit in with the state federal funding? And if the model is successful, both the state and federal government are going to um, see, recognize um, financial benefits along with the long-term health benefits, and how do we then look at using the authority within um, the Medicaid regulation and or working with um, CMS at the federal level to find an appropriate model that recognizes the, the investment, the financing, the payment for services, and the potential, um, the potential payback and investor return. And along with um, some of the challenges with regard to the CMS or, or Medicaid and federal partnership model, how do state financial um, models, the appropriation question that Kaysen touched on, as well as um, how do you work through procurement 
which um, many states have different um, procurement policies. And it really leads to the questions of, you know, what are you procuring? At what point are you procuring, as Kaysen said, an intermediary to carry out the management of this? Are you procuring services directly? And what are the different roles and what are the different impacts on how you do that procurement and what you're actually procuring? And in, in doing this um, work over the last year, I think a few things I want to leave you with to consider as you look at how Pay for Success might um, be an opportunity to fund an initiative within your state. Um, one is, I, I think, um, case and ended with some of the inherent inefficiencies or complexities of the Pay for Success model. But I think as, as more of these um, Pay for Success contracts are completed, is our opportunity in South Carolina to work as part of um, that team of um, other states and cities that were funded through the Harvard Lab and have fellows, that state collaboration and shared learning is going to be really important to make these um, essentially less inefficient or more cost effective from the management and contracting perspective. Um, for us as well, and I think for others that might be um, considering a pay-for-success model, as I talked about earlier, that concept of sim simplicity in order to articulate what are the program goals, what are the um, either interventions or potential types of interventions that the state is interested in seeing, how are you going to measure them, how are you going to set a baseline measurement, and what is that evaluation in really shifting that mindset from everything is possible to something that is clear and easy to articulate, we found to be very important. And then finally, and um, the notion of working through and thinking about um, what regulatory, procurement, or other policy issues might be at play. I think Kaysen talked about it as some of the silos. Um, I think those silos not just exist between local, state, and perhaps federal, but they exist within different parts of an or, um, a state government or the local government. So how do you work through those and how do you understand it is pay for success or social impact bonds or a new opportunity? How do you understand how to work through those um, different challenges? And I think really, the question keeps on being asked and raised if there are inefficiencies, if um, it takes a lot of work, if um, many of the programs can fund these services directly, ask the question about you know, why, why would you consider pay for success? And I think in, in our work over the last year or so, um, a couple of things continue to come to mind. One of them being how do you take a program or an initiative that might be grant funded today, might be um, philanthropically funded, and might work really well in one community within your state, in one part of the state, and how do you actually scale it statewide? And in our situation in South Carolina, um, we've had some success with some um, home visiting programs, and that success has been in some of our urban areas associated with some of our um, strong hospital systems. But in South Carolina, some of our, our, our greatest health disparities exist within our, our rural communities. How do we scale into those communities, and how do we understand what it means to run a statewide program? So those are some of the notion of scaling and the capital investment needed to scale, because with grant funding, Many of these um, promising programs, they don't have the long-term sustainability model. So one of those com questions, I think, about why pay for success, if you need a capital investment, if you need an investment to show scale, many programs like Medicaid may be able to pay for those services once at scale, but it may take a long time to get there. One of the other things that Kaysen touched on, and I, I think as we've worked through this as some flexibility and, and challenging to the model is the notion that investors who want to manage their risk 
Well, they want to make sure that there are well-proven um, models, and that may limit innovation. One of the ideas we've been working on is how do you maybe accept the well-proven model but share some of the risk or take some of the higher risk by innovating those models a little bit. So I think there's some flexibility there. And those really drive the question of at what times is pay for success an effective tool? And for state governments that operate from year to year on budgeting or in short budget cycles, um, programs that may take many years to see the outcomes to are another example of an effective use of pay for success. And as we look in our state at how do you support at-risk mothers um, early in pregnancy, in the first year um, after birth, and how do you then determine is that impact helpful not just to the mother, family, and child, but really to the overall health and school readiness by looking at programs that you can run multi-year I think that that drives a pay for success um, as a tool to help you do that. And as you think about these um, pay for success projects, I think as you've heard from um, all of us today, there is a lot of work to get started. Um, we've been fortunate, as I said, the um, support from the Harvard Civ Lab have allowed us to have um, a fellow to provide that technical assistance and to be very focused. And I think um, if somebody is thinking about this as a um, strategy to fund a promising um, intervention to meet the needs of an underserved or vulnerable population, I think it's really important to have the focused resource because it's going to take a lot to get these off the ground. So with that, um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our project today. And um, I think I'll turn it over to our question and answer period. Okay, this is Arvi here. Thank you so much for those great presentations. Uh, this is a, a new topic to me, and um, so I do have a few questions, but um, I am going to defer to the group first. So go ahead with any questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-toned prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. You may also ask a question by using the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. Again, for a telephone question or comment, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. One moment, please. While we wait, this is Melissa Lewis. Could I um, provide, um, I would like to read the chat question from Tyler White. And the question is, how are the predetermined measures for success developed for complex health disparity issues such as obesity that are influenced by different social de determinants of health? And I think that would be to anyone on the panel. I, I mean, this is John, and I'd be happy to respond. I think. That's pretty challenging. Those are the challenges when we look at these models. Of, on one hand, we understand um, at both a public policy level as well as a, a, a health policy level that issues like obesity, issues like early childhood development are influenced by these broad social determinants and understanding what things to measure, which ones you can get agreement to, and as I, as I sort of hit on, how you can build a project that um, does move the bar a little bit on a topic like obesity, but does it in a way that it's simple enough to explain is, is one of the challenges. And I don't think there's an easy answer to that question today. And that's part of, as we consider um, this method of financing, we have to take into account. And you might want to build a project that is a little narrower in scope, but the measurements are clear. Uh, I, this is Kason. I, 
there uh, there was a um, a group from Israel who did a presentation at, at the G8, and, and they suggested using social impact bonds f to combat type 2 diabetes. Um, and they, uh, they offered, the, first of all, their idea was a one-year intensive uh, intervention that involved uh, healthy lifestyles, uh, services, and then a two-year follow-up. And, then, and to measure that, they proposed that you compare uh, a group of pre-diabetics who were the target populations to, to uh, a control group of pre-diabetics and see differences both in pre-diabetics that actually went and, and developed diabetes and, uh, and as well as comparing the number of healthy states that were actually produced by the intervention. And, and, and again, very, very complicated issue. Uh, and to my knowledge, those, that program hadn't yet been implemented, but these were just suggestions that were thrown out as, as to a way that you might address that. Um, again, very complicated issue, and, and I echo a lot of the things that John said there. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. So we have a few more chat questions, so I'm going to just continue to read them as people um, also um, go through the operator to provide a question. We have one from Lauren Kim. Regarding Kaysen's presentation, can more information be provided about the credit enhancers? I don't quite understand what kind of entity that is or what additional value they provide. Are, the, are these banks is the question. Sure, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, so a, a great example of this is the, the United States' first social impact bond, uh, which is, was in New York City to address inmate recidivism at Rikers Island. And the, the primary investor for that social impact bond was Goldman Sachs. And to providing the, the credit enhancement was Bloomberg Philanthropies, which is a philanthropic foundation. And essentially what Bloomberg did was they said that they would cover the first $7.2 million that would be lost if, if Goldman Sachs, or if the intervention, not Goldman Sachs, but if the intervention failed to, to reduce recidivism rates. So the, the entire investment by Goldman Sachs was $9.6 million. And so really Goldman Sachs was only on the hook for $2.4 million. Uh, but, but Bloomberg, found, um, Bloomberg Foundation wouldn't, uh, wouldn't kick any of that money in unless there was actually a loss in the, um, uh, as a result of the social impact bond. So this is Arvi here. So what is Bloomberg's incentive to become involved in that as a credit enhancer? Sure. Uh, actually, a lot of philanthropic... Uh, foundations out there see a lot of benefit in a social impact bond, uh, a thriving market for social impact bonds. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, with, with a lot of foundations, they, they've got this, this uh, kind of these du dual goals. One, to provide, uh, you know, some sort of service, some, some sort of philanthropy to the community. But on the other end, they have to, they have to protect their endowments. They have to uh, invest in market, uh, you know, m invest in, make investments based on market return rates. And social impact bonds are kind of a, they present this really happy median between the two, where you can invest in something and have a strong social or public health impact, but you're also returning, uh, making a return on your investments. So it, it potentially is a way to, for them to focus more of their resources at having a broader uh, philanthropic impact uh, than, uh, than just focusing only a portion of it at philanthropy and the other portion at protecting this endowment. So they actually have, are showing a, a significant interest in the development of these things. Yeah, I, I think um, to add to that the notion of many of these um, organizations they're doing a lot of this grant making already, which means 
that um, after the grant period, they've expended those funds, I think, as case and set out of their endowments. Here, they're now sharing the risk with investors. And if the, if the interventions are successful, of which many are, they're getting those dollars back to invest in other projects. So it really, I, I think, to, to speak of it in some way, is a, it's a multiplier effect for them because many of these programs are being invested in from their traditional grant making or, or funding um, missions already. So um, they really see it as a way to extend the opportunity to do social good, I believe. We have a question from the phone lines. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to register for a question over the phones, please press the 1 followed by the 4. And this question comes from the line of Tracy Dolan. Please proceed with your question. Hi, this is Tracy in Vermont. Um, we're just starting to explore social impact bonds as, as one way to think about investing in prevention, but we're nowhere near a place where we're ready to implement. I'm curious about um, when investors get paid back, have we had examples where they've been repaid their full investment? And B, um, let's say it's over a three-year period or even a one-year period, whatever the, I guess, contract states. What about beyond that, assuming this is an intervention that is therefore long-lasting, do they continue to get payouts after the first time? Um, I, I'm happy to start. Um, this is John. Um, so we don't have um, these social impact bonds are just starting getting started is the one that um, Kason was just talking about. These are just kicking off, so we don't have this long um, experience, but the structure about them is typically that um, the intervention happens some period, an evaluation, and then there's a payout. And these could be a one-time payout. There could be multiple payouts. There could be acceleration of payouts. But these really are all in the contract structure where the amount of investment that's delivered up front has a potential payout based on what's going to be evaluated, and there'll be a maximum payout, and then the potential for loss. And they really work within the time period set up. So one of the questions then becomes, how do you build this? And the idea is, or one of the other aspects that I think is important, and when we think about this in our Medicaid program, if the intervention that we're working on turns out to be beneficial and shows return, we would expect to then be able to make a case for why it should be part of our Medicaid benefit over time. Now, some people might ask, the, well, wouldn't you just set it up as a benefit today? But the social impact bond approach shares the risk to determining how effective is it really and what is the benefit. And therefore, after the first one, I don't think that social impact bonds, you wouldn't continue doing these. You'd figure out, well, this is positive, and it should be in a core program, and how do you fund it? Or this actually didn't work out, so this isn't something we should continue funding. So one of the other aspects of these, when I look at it from a public policy perspective, is that we create and start a lot of programs. And when we do it, we have the best intention of um, looking at the data and the results to say, was this a good program to operate? But yet when we asked ourselves a hard question about what programs did we actually um, stop funding because the data wasn't there as we thought it would be or the results, you know, we're often, it's often difficult for us to point to good examples. The, the pay for success model gives us, I believe, that built-in discipline about if we get to the end of, of, of a program like this and the investors didn't get paid a return because it wasn't successful, I think it's a hard case to then say we should roll that into the core of our programs. On the other side, I think there's a strong case. Does that give you a sense of, of sort of think about it as a program that has a sort of start and finish? Okay, thank you. And this is this is Kason. Um, preparing for these these webinars, um, I uh, did a little bit of research into looking for some preliminary results, and and I found some interesting things in for both the United Kingdom's, which is the world's first social impact bond, and the New York City, which is the United States' first social impact bond. 
And in the UK, they, their goal was to reduce recidivism rates by about 7.5%. And they just released interim results showing a 12% decrease, and that's in comparison to 11% increase uh, nationally. So that seems to be about a 23-point swing, whereas they're only expecting about a 7.5%. So at least with that one, it seems to be comfortably within hitting its mark. The New York City is still too, too young to see that sort of results. Uh, but what they have noticed is within the first uh, year of introducing the program at Rikers Island, they have saw, saw a substantial drop in inmate violence within the facility itself. I believe the total was between 20 and 30 percent drop in inmate violence. So pr some pretty substantial um, effects. This is Arvi here. Related to that topic, though, in, in public health, often the, um, the outcomes are so long term, and any financial implications of good outcomes are spread amongst various parties, either individuals in less health care costs, or insurers and businesses in lower insurance premiums. So how I could see in Medicaid where you might have an easier ability to funnel the savings into this um, SIB, but in those other cases, how in the world do you get the financial gains from that um, into the SIB? You're right. It's, so it's I, really tricky. Oh, go ahead, John. No, go ahead, and I'll, I'll pick up right okay. after whatever you finish. Yeah, it's, it's no doubt really tricky. Uh, public health issues, there are so many variables, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely challenging. In, in Fresno, California, they actually have a very interesting social impact bond variant. It's a pilot study going on there, and that's targeted at asthma prevention. And, and they, their intervention is, is targeted home-based environmental uh, triggers of asthma-related emergencies. And that's those asthma-related emergencies are said to contribute $87 million in, in, in costs every year. And for that, they are actually measuring those differences in emergency room visits. And instead of a government backing that type of program, they have financial stakeholders. They have insurance companies, large employers, and um, health care providers that are, are going to be reimbursing the investors when they see that drop in, in uh, asthma-related emergencies. So it, for a lot of issues, they're tricky. For this particular issue, there seems to be a way that you can, you can have an impact that, that at least uh, kicks in relatively quickly in the lifetime time of these things uh, where it makes it possible. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I was going to use the Fresno example as well. I mean, I think two things I want to add to that. One is, again, the challenge is, is a group that's trying to think about these is how do you find that model that is simpler, simple enough to explain and track um, while at the same time meets the goals you want. And, you know, I think as Kaysen said, the Fresno example is, you know, it's not the government alone whose services are benefiting, but it's a broader group. And I think it's a good example, obviously a little more complicated. And, and again, I think as you said, in the Medicaid program, um, where we have a population and we're essentially the payer, it's a little easier. And we are looking at both, um, you know, what what can we do to reduce the um, bad birth outcomes by low birth weight, potential NICU days, as well, because those are expensive. Um, those are expenses that are, are expensive when we have to pay them. And if we're able to intervene and reduce those, the savings are pretty clear as well. So we have another chat question. Um, the question is, are there examples of how these bonds have been successfully applied in infectious disease projects where the number of determinants are not as challenging as with chronic diseases? Not that I'm aware of, Kaysen, any, I can't think of anything that 
anyone's even talked about on infectious side. Yeah, I'm I'm drawing a similar blank myself. Um, I I don't believe I've I've seen any proposals that have dr addressed infectious disease projects related to social impact bonds. This is Arvi here. Can you share with me just a, with us just a little bit about what um, Department of Health and Public Health's role is relating to getting the um, the investors and philanthropists? I, I, is that a role for the health officer or the deputy within the department, or do you um, contract that role out, or how, how does that happen? Yeah, I, I mean, I think. Um, Going back to some of the things Kason showed early, he had that role of intermediary. So one of those challenges is, um, you know, a state governments or local governments, um, you know, we they don't generally have that financial and contracting expertise on one hand, and as I think um, most people, you know, we're we're pretty much at capacity to take on new things from time to time, and. That intermediary has really um, played out as a role where these are experts, and there's a, there's a handful of them that are you know specializing in the consulting to government organizations on doing the work of setting up the contracting, doing the work of finding the investments and doing the investors and doing those negotiations. So that's a role that. Um, uh, has really um, been playing out, and that's what um, when Jason was talking about that intermediary. That's where a lot of that both expertise as well as um, skills has been happening. Um, I think over time, is there some example contracting, example language? Um, that role may shift a little bit, but right now that's sort of where that happens. Thank you for that. Um, I believe we do need to close. We are right up on 4 o'clock. I would like to uh, thank everyone for participating in today's webinar, and specifically, particularly thank the speakers, Kaysen Schmidt, Andrea Garcia, and John Supra. Uh, thank you so much for your time and, and your work in this exciting new um, adventure for public health. I had a lot of questions going into this. I, I'm starting to see some examples in my head that could be successful, and I think it'll be really important as we move forward here when we see um, models where this has worked to be able to share those and um, steal from others, basically, um, and use those in other states. So um, I hope that this information provided to you um, on to explore social impact bonds as an innovative financing model for public health agency has been helpful, and we hope that ASTO can serve as a resource during this process. Shortly, um, you will be sent an email with the archived recording and the evaluation. The evaluation will only take a few minutes, and your comments and suggestions are very important to us so we can continue to improve our webinar programs. We also encourage you to share the recording with your colleagues. For questions or suggestions on how the various networks can continue to collaborate in the future, please reach out to the ASTO staff lead for your peer network. This has been a, an, a very informative and interesting call, and I thank everyone for their participation and their time. Have a wonderful day.